Shalom, brothers and sisters, and welcome to this year's conference. I want to start off by reading a scripture. This is Doctrines of the Saints, section 125, starting in verse 10. My church are all they that repenteth and cometh unto me, and this is my doctrine, for the spirit of contention is not of me, but is of the devil. And they that cometh unto me shall humble themselves before me, and be baptized in my name, and shall be saved, for so is the kingdom of God. And the church is my body, and the priesthood, or the power given me of the Father, is my blood. Therefore the kingdom is the church, and therein ye shall find many mansions. I want to start this off with a very sad announcement, and that is Sister Victoria Ramirez is no longer with us. She joined us in February 2019. And she was with us as an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ until August of 2020. And while she did continue forward as an apostle of Christ, she did so parting ways with us here in the fellowship. And she was missed and she will continue to be missed. Without her, I, I don't think that we would be where we are today. She was a very wise and very strong woman that really stepped forward when it was time to organize the fellowship. She wasn't afraid to speak her mind and make sure that what she believed was the word of the Lord was heard. She bore testimony of Jesus Christ as only a special witness of Christ can. And now she is returned to the God that gave her life to enjoy her great reward. She will be missed and she will be remembered. I would like to take a moment now for us to just silently remember her and the works that she did for the Lord. So if you could please bow your heads and offer a moment of silence. In light of these events, we're going to forgo our normal announcements portion and move directly into the Sacrament of Communion. We will present later on this month Christine's report on our finances. We are now going to hear our statement on Communion, and then Christine is going to offer the Communion prayers. At this time, we welcome all present to Christ's table. We invite all who would participate to do so as an expression of the peace and love of Jesus Christ, in whose name we worship. The Lord's Supper is a sacrament, a time to focus on the life, death, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. As disciples of Christ, we renew our covenants and recommit together to His mission, to grow closer to Jesus Christ, as individuals and as a community, worshiping Jesus Christ through God's Word, the sacraments, ministry, outreach, Kabbalah, and Jubilee. We encourage all that are worthy to receive communion to do so frequently and devoutly. O oh God, the Eternal Father, we ask Thee, in the name of Thy Son, Jesus Christ, 
to bless and sanctify this bread to the souls of all those who partake of it, that they may eat in remembrance of the body of thy Son, and witness unto thee, O God, the Eternal Father, that they are willing to take upon them the name of thy Son, and always remember him, and keep his commandments which he hath given them, that they may always have his Spirit to be with them. Amen. O God, the Eternal Father, we ask thee in the name of thy Son, Jesus Christ, to bless and sanctify this wine to the souls of all those who drink of it, that they may do so in remembrance of the blood of thy Son, which was shed for them, that they may witness unto thee, O God, the Eternal Father, that they do always remember him, that they may have his Spirit to be with them. Amen. We have a number of brothers and sisters that are going to offer testimony and a spiritual message for you today. Our topic is moving from the church to the kingdom. And when these brothers and sisters are finished sharing their testimonies and messages, I will share a brief message and then we will close this meeting with a prayer. I am a member of the Church of Jesus Christ and Christian Fellowship in North America, but I wish to remain anonymous because I'm also an active member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. You can call me Samuel, but that is not my real name. I'm a convert, and it had be, has been quite challenging to navigate the Latter-day Saint movement as an LGBTQ convert. And frankly, I'm not here to give you my biography because my story is still unfolding. But I do want to share my testimony, my realization and my experience of my Savior, of the Church, and of the gift of the Holy Ghost. I believe that we have heavenly parents who love us, who care for us, and want us to progress in order to be reunited with them. I believe that I have a heavenly mother that's quite active and co-equal to heavenly father. We don't know much about her at this point, but we can learn more about her and from her, from the woman in her life and from mother nature. And I invite you to please join me in prayer, fasting and repentance so that we can learn more about her in order to get a more fuller picture of the Godhood. I'm quite touched and grateful for my Savior and brother, Jesus, Yeshua, for his atonement and for God giving me the best example he can give me, for sympathizing and empathizing with me and for being the face of my Heavenly Father. I believe that Joseph Smith was a prophet called of God. And I'm so grateful that Heavenly Parents speak to various messengers and various groups, not only at different times, but also at the same time. I know that the spiritual realities are much more gray than black and white, and I feel loved. As an LGBTQ person, I strongly feel that I'm a child of God. I know that Heavenly Parents wants to freely distribute their gifts of the Holy Ghost to equip the church. And I know that if you ask your father for bread, will he give you a stone? No, he will give you the gifts. So I strongly encourage you to ask of your Heavenly Parents for the gifts that you aspire to. I believe that Brother David is a prophet of God, for I have felt the presence of God many times through reading him and hearing from him. I know of the potency and the prayer of the priesthood of God, and I am humbled and I encourage each and every one of you to discern and seek it. And I'm so grateful 
that it's available for all believers, men and women of God. And I believe in unity, in unity and diversity. And I know that this unity is powerful and very important. And I'm grateful for each and every one of you attending conference. And I'm sharing these things in the name of Yeshua, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Good morning. I was asked to speak today about the difference between the church and the kingdom. And I would first ask you, what are your thoughts? What does it mean to go to church? What does the church represent for you? For most of us, it is where we kind of have a community of people with common beliefs. It's kind of a common space. Some people would consider it our church home. But there's a difference between the church and the kingdom. Now, another question I might ask you is, what does home mean to you? What is your level of commitment whether it's in a marriage or whether it's kind of to your goals. The good thing about the church is it helps us learn the basics. It kind of teaches us, just like we would in kindergarten through third grade, we learn how to read. We learn how to do math. We learn the basics there. Um, it gives us structure. It gives us the foundation for all the other possibilities. So we learn kind of letter in the law, black and white, uh, what's good, what's evil. We learn what God wants us to do and what God doesn't want us to do. We learn about the Ten Commandments, uh, the articles of faith. We learn about what not to do, whatever. Well, the important thing is to understand what the goal is. What is the purpose of all of this? whether it's the purpose of life or the purpose of church, it's to help us be willing to take upon his name, to live like him. And, and it's not just his name, but when we do baptism, first we go through you know the process of steps of repentance and having faith and understanding that we are committing ourselves to being servants or members in the family of God. Being willing to commit to God is what makes us part of that kingdom. Now, this is a little bit more the spirit of the law, understanding not just the who, the what, the when, the where, but the how and the why, the rationale. And to me, understanding that in the kingdom of God, we're not all exactly the same. We can be different from each other. We can have different understandings of what commitment is. Um, we can have different fine print per se. One of the scriptures that I love is, you know, choose you this day whom you will serve as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And that is one of those things that I think of when I want to process letter of the law versus spirit of the law and what church means versus being part of the kingdom or body or family of Christ. And I feel like all of those things are interchangeable. You know, some of us are part of the hands. When we're willing to go out and do the Lord's work and serve, we are the hands. Some of us are more focused on what we need to do in our own lives, in our own families. And um, we need to be held accountable. Some of us very much so need to be held accountable and shown that we are continuing to work on what we're doing. Um, I personally am not a big fan of this concept, but, you know, I hear all the time that we are all sinners. We are all, and I, I get it, we all are. But what that means is we all have our own work to do. We all need to figure out our terms for our commitment to God. You don't get to decide that for anyone else. The church is there to say, hey, these are some common doctrine, 
some common principles. And you just like choosing the neighborhood you live in. Whether you want to live in a cottage in the country where your closest neighbor is two miles away, or whether you want to be in a penthouse high-rise apartment in the city, or whether you want to be on the beach or in a trailer park, wherever you choose to live, you get to decide your neighborhood. If you're in an HOA, what your commitment level is to your neighbors. And that's very similar to choosing what church you go to. Finding people who have those common doctrinal beliefs. I personally um, like, you know, the concept of faith without works is dead. We are asked to do, not just believe, but to actually do the Lord's work. And that is where the kingdom comes in. As we work together, just like a family of God or the body of Christ, I don't know about you, but there are times that people in my family have done things that I'm not super happy with. And I have some distant cousins, and I have some people that I talk to on a regular basis, and I have other people that I talk to much less often. And one of them, I have a sister who hasn't talked to me in six or seven years. She has a lifestyle that she she chooses to live. I'm not part of that. She does not choose to connect with me. She doesn't even respond if I send her a Facebook message. But the reality is, is my commitment to being in the family of God, whether we are neighbors, whether we are blood relative, we are all family. And we don't all have to like what the other one does. We don't have to like their house. You might might go over somebody's house and be like, Ooh, I'm just not comfortable there. Their level of mess is not something I'm comfortable with. Or their level of cleanliness and exactness is not something that I feel like I live there. I think we're at times even uncomfortable in our own homes. But our homes are where we're most honest and real too. We present our homes as a representation of us. But the reality is, is nobody's home's perfect. We all have skeletons in our closets. We've all had, you know, if you look at church history, we've all had points where things have been said or done, whether it's, you know, the Pope or whether it's the LDS church or whether it's, you know, anything else. Our history lets us know that we have not always done it well. We all have room to improve and grow. And that's what God wants from us. God wants us to not just know the basics of the ABCs and 123s, addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division, but when to use it, how to use it. Doing His will, being part of the kingdom, Understanding the family of God is about knowing when to use what formula and knowing the formulas. If you think about it in math or in writing, when we effectively are communicating the will of the Lord, when we are teaching others, that's what God wants from us. I personally feel like as a parent, I understand God better than I ever had in any other aspect of my life. I want my children to make good choices, to be thoughtful, to put an effort, to learn, to grow. And to me, that's really the purpose of life is kind of learning and making connections And being willing to put an effort for what you believe is good and right. But my job is not to teach them what to think. It's to teach them how to think. How to discern. 
how to know when to apply the exactness of the law. So if you're on the freeway, the speed limit might be 70. And on a standard day where it's beautiful out, sun is shining, not too much traffic, I will tell you that the flow is probably 77. Good visibility, everybody's just flowing. But that same road, when it's foggy or when it's covered with ice, the standard flow is going to be different. It's not always knowing what the law is. It's about knowing how to be safe. I taught my children at a very young age to, you know, only cross at a crosswalk, to hold hands, to look both ways. You're learning the steps and the process, the tasks that need to be done to be safe. You want to be able to assess and address the hazards with the tasks you're doing. That's what the church is about. It's about letter of the law. It's about the structure. It's about the details. The question is, is how to apply the details. Now, I am a firm believer in finding what works for you. And that's one thing I love about the community here is you can believe whatever you choose to believe. I am not here to condemn anybody for what they believe. You get to work out your details, your fine print in your church and your participation in the kingdom. But what I would ask is that how important is it for you to know that somebody else, their level is different than yours? As somebody who has a home and wants others to come into your home, are there certain people that you just look at and say, nope, you're not welcome here? Because I don't believe that that's what God wants us to do. I believe that just like a parent, I have four kids, just like a parent, each one of my children should feel that they are special and loved and important and valuable just for being them. Do I believe that the Jews are the promised people and the only ones who are saved? No. Do I believe that it is up to me to decide what others can and cannot believe? In their own homes, I have no right to tell somebody what to do if they're not hurting anyone else. So for me, I think that deciding what your house rules are is kind of about what church means to me. It's figuring out the common beliefs of those who go there. The great thing about the kingdom is I think of a kingdom. I think of, you know, Game of Thrones or kind of a concept of fighting for your kingdom and serving in your kingdom and knowing the familiarity of your neighborhood. The great thing is, as we always have the spirit available to us. And to me, that's like a GPS. It teaches us. It guides us of dangers ahead. It warns us. And it helps us see the big picture. It helps us to get back on on track. If there are detours, it helps us with that. And it takes us from where we are to where we're going. If there is someone in Detroit and someone in LA and they're both going to Denver, 
They have a common destination, but their paths are very different. And that's sometimes the challenge with following the concepts of just the church rules. It doesn't take into consideration where you're coming from, where you are. It says that you need to go to Denver, but that's south and west from Detroit. That's north and east from L.A. Is it more important to go south or is it more important to go east or west? Is it more important to go north or is it more important to go east? The reality is, is if you're on one side of a block and you need to get to that exact opposite corner, if you, you know, three lefts is a right. So the question is, is how do you get there? What's your timeline on getting there? And it's not always that important to focus on those details if you're focused on the destination. However, I watched The Chosen the other day. And it was, you know, the third um, season, episode eight, where Peter walks on water and... Jesus says to Peter, keep your eyes on me. I will tell you this. Sometimes, instead of focusing on, say, Salt Lake City, the destination is a place. If we focus on understanding God, God can be everywhere and anywhere because God is with us. The Spirit is with us. And being part of the kingdom, that's the great thing, is it's not a specific destination of Salt Lake City or Mecca or Jerusalem. It's about finding the ability to know what God wants from you, where you are today. It's about understanding the importance and value of you in the kingdom, in the family, and in the body of Christ. We all have a job to do. We are all asked to work and to serve and to use our talents. I personally love the parable of 10 talents. We are not all given the same resources sometimes. We are all asked to multiply what we have. Does that mean that I with two am asked to do the same thing as somebody else with 10? Nope. I'm asked to multiply it. No matter what church you come from, no matter what rules you have lived by, to understand the kingdom of God is to question your commitment. You don't truly marry Christ, but that's what the rituals, the rites, the baptism, that's what it's about. Sacrament, communion, being a member in the church is about focusing on your commitment to being a member in the kingdom. I truly believe that that is the purpose of our lives. That God, just like I want my children to not just behave in front of me and to do what I ask them to do. I want them to be able to think for themselves, to independently assess and address the hazards, and to know how they can work and serve 
and love to make this place a better place for us. That is my concept of why we're here. The purpose of life is learning, is connection, is understanding your commitment to family, home, community, neighborhood. You can call it the church. You can call it the kingdom. You can call it the family. But what I ask of you is your commitment and what you want that to be. And the other thing I ask of you is to hold yourself accountable to it. But it's not your job to hold everybody else accountable. It is your job to invite and encourage and love as God does. I personally can say that my children all think that they are my favorite child. And I don't believe that God wants us to believe any different. It's not to say that you are the promised or the chosen and they are not. It's to say we are all promised and chosen as we are willing to commit to God. And I know it's silly, but my son plays Pokemon sometimes and there's this character, Ash, that says, I choose you to have Pokemon go out and fight for him. But we also have to be willing to say, I choose you to God. To take upon the name, whether it's being a member of the church or understanding that you are taking upon the name of Christ with communion. But the reality is, is if you are living in a way that supports others, builds community, and you are holding yourself accountable, it is only yours to invite and share, not to judge and regulate. I appreciate the opportunity to share what my understanding is. And I would say, know the doctrine, know the fine print, but know that it's your contract with God. And you can make your house, the house by the wildflowers and the cottage, you can make your house, the penthouse in New York City, you can make your house, the beach, You can make it traditional. You can make it modern. You can likely have very similar people around you. But know that if a genetic test was done, we are all the family of God. I leave these things with you. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Hey everybody, um, it's good to be with you. Um, my name is Nick Senzi, and um, Brother Fairman asked me to uh, give this talk. Um, I have been um, kind of on the periphery of the community, um, just keeping track of it on Facebook. I believe I've been to a couple meetings and things. But I've known um, Brother Fairman for several years now, and he and I have talked. And um, I feel like this group is is a, is a good place. I um, don't necessarily have what it takes to fully be a member of an organization or to participate that closely but I'm I'm glad to know that this group is there and I've been very grateful for Brother Fairman's support. He asked me to give this little little talk slash testimony today and and I'm really happy to to do that. Um, it's been a, a really rough uh, month for me and I've had a lot of life challenges and so it's been good for me to be able to um, kind of concentrate on some of these issues about about my faith which I haven't thought that much about lately and um, 
I'll tell you all about that. Anyway, my name's Nick. I, I grew up in Kansas City. I'm from Independence, I was born in Independence, Missouri. Just kind of a, a strange place for uh, a, a Mormon boy of the Salt Lake Church. Um, I'm just going to say, if I say Mormon or if I say LDS or any of these things I'm not supposed to say about the Salt Lake Church now, that refers to my faith tradition, which is, is the Salt Lake City variety. At any rate, it's kind of funny because, um, like I said, I am from... I grew up in, in, in Independence, Kansas City, and um, my family's still there. So uh, usually this is not the kind of Mormon that, that you'll have from that place. Anyway, um, I am from like fourth generation Mormon, and I um, was a good, I was a good little kid. I was a good Mormon boy. I was very compliant. Um, I did all the things. I, I was an Eagle Scout. I went on a mission. Um, I love my mission. I served in Montreal. Um, I got married in the temple to a wonderful woman, and um, we have two children. And the problem with the church for me started when I was very young. And the reason why is because I'm gay. So, you know, when you grow up in that environment, you always know you're on borrowed time. You're like, how long can I keep this up? Um, the reason that my wife and I are, st my ex-wife and I are still best friends is because I was somehow able to summon the strength and the courage to tell her that I kind of liked, like boys before we got married. And, um, I didn't feel like I could not be truthful about that. And honestly, it has made all the difference. It's made all the difference for us and our ability to be a family after, um, after also after separating uh anyway all of that to say that uh my relationship with the church has always been conditional it's always been conditional in the sense that if if i stop doing if if i just if i if my little white knuckles somehow are too weak to hold on then the church is going to swoop in and, and destroy me and leave me for dead. And I knew that. I knew that. I had no illusions about that. But why am I here right now talking about this? It's because there's so much that I loved about it. I believe in Mormon cosmology. I think it's beautiful. The idea that we have a heavenly mother. This is beautiful. This is groundbreaking stuff. Um, our ability like mysticism that we believe that we can have the spirit of god reveal things to us in fact the reason why i i decided i was fine to leave the church was because it was revealed to me um i have a story where i was doing a this is called a hug a mormon booth we did it at gay pride it was very it was a lot for me it's like the first time i ever went out and did anything that was gay and I was with my ex-wife and I was not out of the closet at all. Um, long story short, um, I had the most beautiful spiritual experience in my life with all the crazy gay people scantily clad and the Lord the Spirit revealed it to me really, really strongly that, gosh, I love all these people. And um, then I kind of like, kind of almost visually saw a finger pointed around it, right at me. And it was like, that means you. And so the very same principles that my church growing up taught me, they taught me I was wrong and that, you know, I, I would have to basically live as a spiritually crippled person. Um, and yet they taught me enough to know to recognize the truth when it came to me. So that's been something that that I think about, that I still think about. It's like, gosh, it's almost like it gave me the, it was a puzzle and, and then it gave me the keys to solve it. So I, I do think about that and, and I really, really believe in the Mormon, um, uh, the quest for, I guess, truth. You know, Joseph Smith said, truth is my religion. And what better religion can you have? Like, we're never going to know all of the truth in this life. But it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. It means we haven't found it out. We haven't found it out in whole. We've only found parts of it out. And I feel like this is why we have life. This is because we're looking for these things. Um, 
So let me talk a little bit about this, um, about this theme of um, moving from the church to the kingdom. That's been, it's a really personal and relevant topic to me because that's what I've been trying to do. So if you look in the Bible um, and you look in the teachings of Jesus, he doesn't really talk about the church very much. Um, so the word church in English comes from Greek. Sounds like a good Anglo-Saxon word, but it actually does come to us from Greek. And it, it means the house of God. So literally designating a building. Now, if you look at the Romance languages, their word also comes from Greek. Uh, for example, in French, we say église, which is from the Greek ecclesia. Um, and that word means called out. That means that one, one would assume it means people who got, who, whom God has called out of society or what have you, and he had designated them his, his people. And so the question is, like I, I think every church today, or religion, or church, and we use those terms interchangeably also, every church wants to claim a Venn diagram that overlaps exactly with the kingdom of God. For example, there was a, a, a Salt Lake General Authority uh, not, not that long ago, months ago. Uh, he said something where if you you should substitute the church in uh, wherever you see the Savior or vice versa because they're the same. And I was like, that is peak apostasy right there. That's peak apostasy. That's peak trusting in the arm of flesh because the church is an earthly institution. Um, the kingdom of God is a heavenly institution. A kingdom is something that someone rules over. And it's not a person with a title. It's not uh, someone who got called because they know someone. It's not someone who is successful in their business affairs. It is ruled by the king. And so that is Jesus Christ is the king and the ruler of his kingdom. And we're his children, which makes us, um, which makes us a, a holy family, a, a royal family. Um, and we know that all of us are, are God's children. And this makes me think of the sealing um, power and Joseph Smith's intent to weld the whole human family together with that. Uh, so anyway, um, one of the things that I, I, I think most about when I think of moving from the kingdom, the church to the kingdom, is a thing that I've had to do is just completely let go of the idea that this church is here for me. Um, there is, a, in the book of Revelation, um, the story of the woman, uh, which I think Joseph Smith um, ascribed, Joseph Smith's translation said that the woman of Revelation, the woman of the apocalypse, I think is what we call her, that that represented the church. And I actually don't think I can justify that in my mind. And maybe if I were talking to him, we could hash that out. Uh, the Catholic tradition and also uh, most Protestants probably, that, that woman they consider to be Mary. And the Mary thing sounds too much like a just so story also to me to be to be true. At any rate, I don't know exactly what it is, but, um, or it could be the church in the sense that we are the called out. We are called out. Because I have often felt called out and called and revealed to to leave. And maybe that's what it's about. Because um, the book of Revelation talks about how uh, the woman was um, taken into the wilderness and she was safe there. And it says she was, she was safe and dwelt there for a time, time, and half a time. And that's like, I don't know, it's like 1,200 days or something, but it's very pretty language-wise. Anyway, um, that is the thing that really sits heaviest on my head when I think about moving from the church to the kingdom. It's this um, autonomy we have to be willing to take the autonomy 
on ourselves. No one is going to, they're not going to be next to us when we're at the judgment bar. Russell M. Nelson's not going to be next to us. Our bishop isn't going to be next to us. It's just us. And I really do think the Lord's going to be like, are you honest with yourself? Are you even telling yourself the truth? Do you, do you, you know, do you, when you say something, do you recognize you might be wrong? Do you understand that you see through a glass darkly and you have so much else to learn? I really think those are the kinds of things and I feel like that the, my my search for truth has been I'm going to go and I'm going to look for the truth and you know what if I screw up this is why we have a savior this is why we have a savior to, to be our um, safety net because we're going to screw up and we're going to look for truth and we're going to sometimes not find it and we might even find bad things but that doesn't mean we don't qualify for the kingdom of God. It might mean we don't qualify for a church, but it doesn't mean we don't qualify for the kingdom of God. So thank you for listening to me, everyone. Um, have a good day. Moving from the church to the kingdom, our role in creating freedom. Hi, everyone. I'm grateful to bring this message today. Freedom, to me, is the most crucial aspect of building a kingdom in Christ. The pre-life story begins with the duality of freedom versus force, and freedom is what we chose. They say freedom isn't free. Why do they say that? While we are all born with inherent free agency, we can be born into structures that imprison us. We have a natural ability to create whatever belief structures we want. That's how our brains work. As we do this in alignment with spirit, we create Christ's kingdom. When we mentally put God in the king's throne, our actions manifest accordingly. When we are oppressed and locked into spiritual bondage on a cultural level, when we are programmed what to think and how to react, we are not utilizing our free agency. To break free from that egoic prison, we must completely transform ourselves, melt our minds down into goo like a caterpillar melts down in the cocoon, and construct a new freedom-based mindset. Like a caterpillar turning into a butterfly, God has put it in our nature to transform ourselves. We have to dethrone the broken storytellers that have taken root in our minds and consciously rewrite those stories in alignment with spirit. Spiritual freedom needs to be learned and earned. It doesn't come for free, at least not in these days. We have divine responsibilities to earn this freedom and create the kingdom. In 2 Nephi 1.13, Lehi says, Oh, that ye would awake, awake from a deep sleep, yea, even from the sleep of hell, and shake off the awful chains by which ye are bound, which are the chains which bind the children of men, that they are carried away captive down to the eternal gulf of misery and woe. As long as we avoid the accountability for our freedom, we will continue to be trapped in misery. I'd like to discuss today three ways in which we can be responsible for our own freedom. The first way we can take responsibility for our freedom is by healing our past trauma and the conditioning that binds us. In Genesis 12:1, God tells Abram, Get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house to a land I will show you. Why would anyone give such vague directions to a new place? Usually, you know where you're starting from, and you need to know about where you're going. Rabbi Sam Simon Jacobson from the Meaningful Life Center had great insight to this verse. I randomly found his channel on YouTube while preparing this talk, and he's got a lot of great-looking content. He explained that in this verse, Genesis 12:1, God is stressing the things Abram must leave behind to find this new land. This new spiritual land, full of freedom and blessings, is incomprehensible to us before we leave behind these three things. The first thing we need to leave is our country, the spiritual land we are born into. This symbolizes our natural state of egoism and carnality. We are born completely egocentric, and we are all faced with needing to learn who we are as an aspect of the one God. We must learn empathy and compassion. We must learn our unique divine role in this life and match our egos to that divine role to escape misery and find true joy. 
The second thing God tells Abram to leave behind is his family. Family here symbolizes the trauma and early life conditioning from our families and parents that we need to heal. We all have some, some more than others. Abuse and limiting beliefs can bind our nervous systems, making it really difficult, if not impossible, to feel divine connection freely. No matter who was the cause of these abuses and this unhealthy programming, it is up to us, and only us, to heal it. We can ask for help, but we must do the mental and emotional work that is required. Abram was told he must be the one to leave behind his old life to find the new one. We are the ones responsible for healing the damage done, done to us. We are all one, and we each have been tasked with, our, with healing our own parts to build a healthy body. In my experience, I feel that those of us alive today have thousands of years of generational trauma to break. And we are here because we are the ones strong enough to do it. The third thing God tells Abram to leave is his father's household. This symbolizes society. Society, just like our families and our natural carnal state, can trap us in hell. We have a divine responsibility to free ourselves from the unhealthy paradigms and structures that keep us from freedom. None of the things that are in e none of these things are an easy task. It can take a lifetime, maybe even multiple generations of lifetimes, to evolve into healthier societal paradigms. We need to find our roles in this great work and play our parts in the body. The second way we can be responsible for our own freedom is by using our minds to reason with each decision we make. Thomas Jefferson said about religion, Your reason is now mature enough to examine this object. In the first place, divest yourself of all bias in favor of novelty and singularity of opinion. Indulge them in any other subject rather than that of religion. It is too important and the consequences of error may be too serious. On the other hand, Shake off all the fears and servile prejudices under which weak minds are servilely crouched. Fix reason firmly in her seat, and call to her tribunal every fact, every opinion. Question with boldness even the existence of a god, because, if there be one, he must more approve of the homage of reason than that of blindfolded fear. I repeat that we must lay aside all prejudices on both sides, and neither believe or reject anything because any other person or description of persons have rejected or believed it. Your own reason is the only oracle given to you by heaven, and you are answerable not for the rightness, but uprightness of the decision. I just want to repeat that last part. Your own ability to reason is an oracle given to you by heaven, and you are answerable for the uprightness of the decision. God gave us minds to reason with, not to avoid reason and cling to untruths blindly out of fear. We are answerable. We are responsible for developing our reasoning skills and using this gift to make upright decisions. One of my favorite scriptures is Romans 12, 2. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. We must keep renewing our minds so that we can break free from cognitive prisons and be the expression points for divine freedom in this world. Let us prove together what is that perfect will of God. The third way I see us taking responsibility for our freedom is by building an environment of trust. To have a free society, we must all be able to trust each other to do our parts. In one of his videos, Rabbi Simon Jacobson used an analogy I really liked of God's divine symphony. Imagine we are a grand divine symphony playing our music here in this life. What is it that makes a symphony sound like one song rather than a bunch of people making different noises? It's trust and reliability. In a good symphony, you would be able to focus on playing your part uprightly because you could trust that everyone else would be playing their own parts uprightly too. Having to worry whether or not you can trust those around you to play their part reliably and consistently creates an environment of fear, not trust. Fear traps us and limits our free agency. Unfortunately, at times, freedom means allowing those around us to play parts that don't seem right to us. We need to focus on freedom, and remember we can only control ourselves. We have a divine responsibility to add to the trust environment by being accountable, reliable, and consistent, no matter what anyone else does. 
In an environment where we can trust that everyone will be accountable, reliable, consistent, we can truly be free. And we can build this environment one person at a time. So we can see from these three examples how freedom really isn't free and how much responsibility we have in learning and earning our freedom. We need to heal our past traumas and conditioning to free ourselves from emotional prisons. We need to use our God-given gift of reason to steer clear of blind fear and other cognitive traps. And finally, we need to collectively create an environment of trust so we can freely play our unique and divine parts, creating harmony in God's great symphony. Thank you for listening. I hope this has helped kindle the fires of freedom in your heart and reassured you on your healing journey. We can build this kingdom as the one body in Christ. Amen. A special thank you to all those who share their testimony and their thoughts on this topic of moving from the church to the kingdom. This is a topic that is very, very important to us here in the fellowship. And I do want to say that if you want to learn more about the concept of moving from the church to the kingdom, there's an excellent book by author Doug Hatton called From the Church to the Kingdom. I highly recommend it. And in fact, we are planning on making a class based on that book for the School of the Prophets at some point in the, hopefully the near future. I want to explain to you my thoughts on what that means. First, I want you to understand that in the fellowship, when we use the word church, it just means Christian. It means disciple of Jesus Christ, follower of Jesus Christ. Mormon is another word that would fit for the church because there are a number of us in the Latter-day Saint movement who, like Joseph Smith, consider ourselves to be Mormon, and I'm, I'm one of them not ashamed of that title. I believe that the Book of Mormon is a witness of Jesus Christ. And so therefore, to call myself a Mormon means that, like the Book of Mormon, I also am a witness of Jesus Christ. And so therefore, it's, it's not a term that I'm ashamed of or that I would ever regret using. In fact, just as in the New Testament, the Book of Acts, it says that and at this time, these Jews that followed Christ began to be called Christians. I would say that in the by the 1830s that some Christians began to be called Mormons. And just as the New Testament former day saints accepted the term Christian, I have no problem accepting the term Mormon. And growing up in the Mormon faith, in the Latter day Saints tradition that I was raised in, I was always taught that the church and the kingdom were the same thing. And in a sense, they are, but also in another sense, they're not. Because in the world's view, when we talk about the idea of church, we're generally talking about something that divides us as God's people. We're talking about organizations designed with the creeds of men, the dogmas that keep us bickering with one another. When the Savior spoke to Joseph Smith in his first vision in, in what we call the sacred grove, made sacred because of the presence of the Lord there in that grove, he said that it was their creeds that were an abomination before him because they talked, good talk with their mouths, but their hearts weren't in it. Their hearts were in their own doctrines. I'm obviously paraphrasing here. I want to go over the scripture that I read at the beginning of the service. In verse 9, it actually says, The Lord asks us a question. I shall ask thee, What is the church of Jesus Christ in Christian fellowship? Did I not tell my servant, Joseph Smith Jr., the meaning of my church? And that brings us into verse 10, which is what I read at the opening of this, of this conference. <clears throat> my church are all they that repent and come unto me, unto Jesus Christ. Nowhere does it say that it's a particular 
organization. Merely all those that come to Christ. And it says that this is his doctrine. And he reminds us, as it says in 3 Nephi, the spirit of contention is not of God, but is of the devil. God doesn't like us Latter-day Saints fighting with each other any more than he liked other Christians fighting with one another in Joseph Smith's time. He says that when we come to him, we will humble ourselves and be baptized. Now, what does it mean to be baptized? I want to be very clear here. Yes, there's the idea of being washed with water, and I don't fault that in any way, shape, or form. I fully support the idea of being baptized by immersion. I've been baptized myself a number of times, and I've baptized a number of people. But in 3 Nephi, I won't say but, I'll say and, and in 3 Nephi, Jesus says that the Lamanites were baptized by the Holy Spirit, and he knew the Holy Spirit fell upon them, and he knew it not. So I believe that baptism is more than just the idea of being dunked under water. I think that the, the, the dunking is symbolic of the true baptism that we've received in our hearts. It's being born again. Because it's that baptism, it's the change of who we are that saves us. And as it says in verse 11, for so is the kingdom of God. Those of us, not that have just been buried in water and pulled out, but those of us that have been buried spiritually, in spiritual living water, the living water that Jesus Christ offered to the woman at the well. We've been immersed in that water. And so because of that, we are all members of the kingdom, regardless of what worldly organization we belong to. And so in verse 12, it says, The church, therefore, us, you, me, everyone that's been converted, that is every disciple of Jesus Christ, regardless of church, worldly church, sect or organization, or denomination, is the body of Jesus Christ. And the priesthood, that power that was restored to the earth through Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery, the power given to God through the Father is his blood. So we have the body, us. And the blood, what gives life to the church? The priesthood, the power of God. So it gives life to every organization that follows Jesus Christ, to every saint, to every Christian. Therefore, the kingdom is the church, and therein ye shall find many mansions. What does that mean, find many mansions? I gave a presentation once on the Latter-day Saint movement for a college course, a religion course that I was taking. And going on Wikipedia, I said that there's at least 67, at that time, I don't know how many are listed on there now, Latter-day Saint denominations or churches. Not just one, 67. Since I've discovered that from 1830 to now, there's been thousands and upon the earth, active today, there are at least 200, perhaps more. There are small churches with just a few people in them, and there's larger churches with hundreds or thousands of people. Now, none, obviously, are as large as the Salt Lake City Church, or even as large as Community of Christ, the second largest church. That doesn't make them less valid. They're all a part of the kingdom. So I want to describe the kingdom like this. I don't know where you are in the world, but here in the United States of America, where, where I live, when I walk down the street, we're all a part of the same nation. We're all American citizens. We may belong to different political parties or the same political party or no political party. We all may be religious, maybe Christians, Muslim, Hindu, Buddhist, Jews, pagan, or any number of other things. Or we may be nothing. Some of us are more and some of us are less educated. But we're all still a part of the nation that is the United States of America. And the way the world works now, there are many, many other nations in the world that function exactly the same way. 
You all belong to whatever nation you're born into, or kingdom, if you will. And yet, we all have our separate groups that we organize with. I want to testify to you that the same holds true with the kingdom of God. When we talk about this idea of moving from the church to the kingdom, it's not forgoing these organizations. It's not saying, hey, you've got to shut down. You've got to give up your 501c3 or what have you. It's nothing like that. It's that as a kingdom, we all function as one in the name of Jesus Christ, regardless of whichever club, if you will, we're a member of. Because that's really what we, we are. We're just members of different religious book clubs. We all use similar or the same books. Some more, some less. But really, that's what modern church organizations are. We get together and we, we read and study the same books. The Bible, the Book of Mormon. For Latter-day Saints, these are the two fundamentals. From there, perhaps it's the Doctrine and Covenants. And there's a number of different ones. Perhaps it's the Elijah message. Perhaps it's the book of the law of the Lord. And there are several other scriptures in the Latter-day Saint movement that it could be. But whatever books we study, at the end of the day, what makes us the kingdom of God is that we share the same desire to come to Christ and to bring others to Christ. And how much more can we do if we work together? A couple of years ago, where I live, a tornado just swept through a part of the town, destroying homes, cars, lives. And when it was time for people to come and help, they said, hey, it's safe. We need volunteers. One church didn't show up. One group of people didn't show up. One political party didn't show up. There were people from many churches. There were people who didn't belong to churches. There were people from a number of political parties. And there were people from no political party. We just all got together as citizens of the same city to help one another. Imagine what we could do as Latter-day Saints if we moved away from the low here and the low there that Joseph Smith experienced in the 1820s. And instead, focused on helping those in need as one in Christ. What if instead of pointing fingers we shared ideas and concepts. I want you all to know that I love you very much. That this work the Lord has called me to do is to serve you. And it is my prayer that we can move away from the creeds, the dogmatism, and all the things that Satan uses to tear us apart and become the kingdom of God that the Lord has asked us to be, to become the prophetic people that the Lord has asked us to be. So this coming year, I would ask each of you, to take a moment and ask someone for their opinion without waiting to give them yours. Take the time to soak in their thoughts, to find out why they think the way they do, and to see if there's a benefit, if there's a lesson, if there's something there you can learn. Even if that something is deepening your own personal beliefs, and then I want to ask you to do the hardest thing that we as human beings can do. And that is, if you disagree with them, love them. Accept them. 
help them. Don't be their friend in a passive way. Don't be an acquaintance. But truly get to know them and let them know that you accept them, regardless of whether or not they accept you, and regardless of whether or not they accept your beliefs. And let them know that you love them and that you don't have to disagree with them. You can merely have a different opinion. And that's okay. We are all the church. And when we work together, we are all the kingdom. That's my message this conference. And I'll leave it with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. I'm now going to offer a closing prayer. Elohim Shaddai, we bow our heads before you at this time. Thank you for all of your many blessings. Thank you for all those that you've sent in to help with this fellowship for whatever amount of time that they've spent here. We ask that you please put a special blessing on Sister Victoria's family and all of us that are her friends. Help them and comfort them in this time of need. Help all of us in this time of need. We ask that you soften the hearts of all those that you have called in leadership positions throughout this Latter day Saint movement in Christianity in general, and in all of the Abrahamic faith, as we all worship you, we may view you differently. We may call you by different names, but you are the same God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that we all worship. Help us to see past our differences. Help us to see the things that unite and connect us. Help us to be better people. Help us to love one another. To love our friends, our families, our neighbors, even our enemies, even as Jesus Christ commanded us. We'd like to put a special blessing at this time on all those that are listening to this conference. A blessing of closeness to the Spirit, of prophetic utterance, prophetic voice, prophetic understanding, prophetic ears, that we may hear one another speaking spirit to spirit, listening to one another with true intent of heart, and seeking diligently to meet the needs of one another, that we may be the Zion that you've called us to be. That we may be the peacemakers that you've called us to be. That we may be the prophetic people that you've called us to be. In the scriptures, you call us all kings and queens, priests and priestesses, which both elevates us and makes us equals at the exact same time. Help us to understand these words. Help us to understand these callings that you've given us. Help us to deepen our relationship, 
a very personal relationship with you and with one another. Help us to connect. Help us to network and create a safety net for all those suffering spiritual PTSD, for all those that are spiritually homeless. Please bless Alan and all those that you have called to assist him in building the Church of Christ, the non-denominational church, that people may worship together one with another. Please bless me and all those that you have called to assist in the School of the Prophets, that before this time next year, we will have the school off the ground, have people taking and finishing courses, and helping to prepare them to help Alan and all those in their circles and congregations and neighborhoods to be the ministers that you have called them to be. Please bless the sisters that you have called to help organize the women in the Latter-day Saint movement. That the power of the priesthood will flow through them. Help them to know your love for them. Help them to understand your call to them and for them. Give them the courage to step forward after generations of being told that the priesthood is something for the men that they are to sit on the sidelines. We are so thankful for all the things that you have blessed us with, the technology that we can have this conference and share with one another. And for all the people that you've led out into the wilderness so that we as the sheep roaming free can gather to be the strong herd that you need us to be and be the ensign upon the hill the lighthouse lighting the way for all of those that are lost or stragglers that are rejected by the churches of men. Again, we thank thee for all thy blessings. And we pray these things to thee humbly. In the name of thy beloved Son, even Jesus Christ. So mote it be. Amen.